much, Vandana. Hello, everyone. I have. Do you hear me? Yes, you do. Hello, Dublin. I'm super excited to be here today with you. It's my first time to visit Ireland, and I find it wonderful. But the first thing that I'm going to start with is actually what is fascinating is that I learned a new fact about Ireland, specifically Dublin. The founder of Guinness, so Guinness beer, everyone knows, and I learned also a new word, stout, <laughs> started his business in 1759, and he took a lease for 9,000 years. You heard that right. His lease for the business was for 9,000 years. He definitely wasn't afraid of commitment, right? <laughs> and also, the rent was 45 pounds per year. Take me back in time. Anyway, today I have the pleasure to discuss a very important topic, which is all about artificial intelligence or AI-assisted coding. Benefits, obviously, but as well, challenges. And before I go into the details, I want to quickly tell you a little bit more about myself for the ones who do not know me. I traveled from Spain to come to Dublin, but I am based in Singapore. Before Singapore, I had the chance and the opportunity to visit several countries. I'm originally from Poland, which I left when I was seven years old, to actually find myself with my parents. I couldn't fly by myself at seven. <laughs> in North Africa, Tunisia. From there, I went to France, then Qatar, then Asia. Why this is relevant today is because all this travel and culture exploration helped me to learn a lot, but especially to understand various perspectives from technology, but as well the technology applications around the world. I also wrote a few books. Some of them are a little bit strange. And I built a product that is actually a software based on the cloud, obviously. Today we cannot have anything anymore on premises. And this software actually, which was built by my team more than myself, is very relevant for today's talk. Because not only the whole journey helped me to learn how difficult it is to build a tool, but also it made it very obvious what is required by customers, what is required by leaders in the space, and what is required by startups to be competitive in the space. And technology, specifically AI, is one of the main and very important technologies that I believe will change the way of how new startups, for example, develop softwares. But just in case anyone doesn't know what AI is, just in case, I actually won't give you the definition by myself. I just ask AI, what, do, what does AI mean? The best way is to ask the tool itself. And the tool itself clearly says that AI is artificial intelligence that helps developing computer systems that will mimic or try to actually kind of be human intelligent. Obviously, every one of us heard about AI and ChatGPT and others, which actually I need to tell you another fun fact before I move forward. ChatGPT actually in French language means something really funny. But as this is recorded, I'm going to just tell you the first part, which is chat means actually cat. I let you find out the other few three letters by yourself. So even though the implementation today of AI is fascinating, from social media to marketing to content writing, we are still not at the stage where we see literally human-looking robots walking around and communicating with us. The not only development has advanced a lot, but there are still areas and aspects that need a lot, a lot more of work and challenges that need to be overcome. But one of the examples that is very interesting in software development is Copilot by GitHub. And I'm sure some of you already heard about that. It's a tool that not only helps 
to continue coding, but as well is able to generate source code and build functions even for the developers. Fascinating way of increasing productivity of software developers. And today, my focus will not be only on AI challenges around ethical aspects or just the benefits about, let's say, having the generated code. I want to take a perspective of a business owner as well as a technical practitioner. Why? Because I'm hoping that I make you think a little bit about the business perspective. How does a startup owner think? How does a CIO of a multinational think about AI benefits? And how can we, technical practitioners, actually help them to understand the challenges? So benefits are amazing. The future of software development absolutely will and need to consider the use of AI. There is no going back. If any of you today think that there is still a possibility that AI will not be used and complete part of our lives, think again and go watch a little bit Netflix. But AI in the coding world or the software development world has different aspects. And there is the AI assistant coding, which is actually a powerful tool that helps not only write, test, but optimize the code. And then there is the AI generated code. AI generated code, fully. And those two are different, not only from the perspective of how AI is used, but especially from the legal perspective, which is very, very important because it will change of how we use AI for our daily activities and especially on how we use AI to write code. So let's take a, an example or a joke. AI assisted coding is like having a virtual assistant who is really eager to please. And when you ask it to write hello word, it writes the whole operating system. No one is loathing, I guess that. AI generated joke. Someone told me AI doesn't have human emotions. Well, you always can try and it will generate jokes even about itself. Now, I wanna go back. We have seen the AI assisted coding. We have seen AI generated coding. I want to take a step back as a business owner. What do I think about AI? The first aspect that comes to my mind AI can speed my development. AI can make my software developers more productive, more efficient. This is my business perspective, a very capitalist, price-oriented approach. Now, most of the businesses will look at it from a cost perspective. Why? Because business is about generating revenue and maximizing profit. If you add ESG, you might find businesses who want as well to create value, but that's not the reality of all businesses around the world. And we need to remember that. Increased productivity means that we are able to perform some tasks in an efficient way, but as well in a quality way. And when I look at AI and the way of how today, for example, software developers are needed as well as how much Actually, there is a lack in supply. My first turn is to go and find a tool that will help me to address my lack of supply of software developers to increase my productivity. And this is a problem or a challenge of every business owner, every CTO that is trying to hire developers. They put an ad online, one month after, two months after, six months after, they don't find people fa falling into the right criteria that are able not only to de develop the code, but they're able to fit into the budget limitations. Supply and demand, right? More demand, higher supply price. So the productivity of software developers is not only important for the business from a very traditional way, but it's also important to understand 
that productivity of a developer will be based on the amount of code as well as the number of features that needs to be developed. And this has been a learning for me as well. So myself, I code badly, but I try. And when I develop something in 24 hours, because I believe it's a simple application that I can do it by myself, I actually want my team to do the same and develop it very quickly. But the reality is that writing code is much more complex than that. And especially if you have a team collaborating and you have complex features and complex applications. So the productivity is not 24 hours around to get an application that works. When you hire a new software developer, it might take between one month to three months. Experience speaking, maybe you had even longer periods of time. And the one month is when you have someone who is really senior, making sure that they understand the application, making sure that they understand the architecture, and they can bring value to whatever you're building. Now, just a disclaimer. This presentation, of course, used AI as well, right? How can I talk about AI without using AI? So there is a lot of things that I will come back on it and mention how AI is shaping not only our daily activities, but in general, the world. Now, if I go back to the software development, which I, ch I find sorry fascinating, is if you look at the data, writing 1,000 lines of code takes approximately 34 hours. That's more than one full working day, right? and certainly a long time. Especially if you have an application of 700,000 lines, that will take literally 23,800 hours. That's a long time. And three years, almost, of my life. I have a lot of more wrinkles, wrinkles and especially a lot of more sleepless nights. So from 34 hours for 1,000 lines to actually 700,000 lines to build an application that is not the most complex, by the way. It's just an application, let's take an example, that would be similar to basic CRM. Now, this is the case of a human person who will need that amount of time. But when we look at AI and the capabilities of AI, we find that there are tools that are able to generate thousands of lines, not in hours, in minutes. Only a few minutes to generate hundreds of lines. So a few minutes and you have already your thousand lines. So instead of 34 hours, I find myself having 1,000 lines in 10 minutes, for example. Does that make a difference? It does. Obviously, the numbers are just average and exaggerated for the purpose of this presentation. And also, I didn't check the math. But what does that mean? This means that when I look from the perspective of money, I'm talking about money a lot because honestly, businesses need money to survive and profitability. We cannot ignore it. So when we look at the financials behind this, instead of 34 hours, we're talking about 10 minutes. And when I try to recruit a software developer, usually I get, you know, between 10 USD to 50 USD. Sometimes I get even 2,500 USD per day lately. They're not hired. <laughs> so, and the AI tools are offering actually 0.02 cents per 750 words. I'm coming to the comparison between both. But basically here, what we see is that there is a massive difference in price. And a massive difference in price means an amazing difference for the business. So for a thousand lines of code, that we talked about initially, that would require 10 minutes with AI, we can estimate 12,000 words, 
And that actually means that instead of paying a software developer of 1,700 USD, I will use a tool, either free, ChatGPT has a free way of generating code, or I will pay 240 USD. Now, if we go back to the business owner who is really in need to manage costs and reduce their expenses, what would be the decision here? Hiring a software developer or using an AI tool? Money speaks. Money rules the world, right? And AI tools are growing like mushrooms, I like to say, around the world. We are seeing a thousand of softwares around. Now, the examples include softwares that are actually using features where you can directly generate code, using features that auto-complete, or either review and optimize tools. So now you're wondering, so basically I came on stage to tell you AI is going to replace software developers. Well, not really, actually. Because what I explained about costs is only one perspective, and the perspective that eventually some of the business owners will see and will focus on. But what does that also mean is that all those tools that are developed and available anywhere in the world will make anyone and everyone feel they can code. Someone in Poland, someone in Tunisia, someone in India, anyone can take a computer and decide that they want to write code. Amazing? Well, I would say run. Not so much. Why is that? First and foremost, I come from cybersecurity. I cannot not talk about cybersecurity. Code generated either by using AI fully or assisted by someone without the right fundamentals in security will only extrapolate our problems with security in the code. We'll have code that doesn't have the right security in place, and we will have code that will expose our applications to very, very common vulnerabilities. And this is an example of AI-generated code. If I am talking to someone who never wrote code but just asked the AI tool to write it for them and then copy-paste this code, they might as well use it immediately. So this technology is fascinating, is amazing. From a business perspective, definitely productivity, speed, cost reduction, but it does come with risks. And the risks are not only about security. We talk about, in the media, about ethical issues, biases, <coughs> etc. But security and vulnerabilities are something that is, as I mentioned, really important for me personally, so I would like to focus on that. And before coming to this talk, I had really a very nice, um, I would say, surprise. There was a new art, news article that came up in the News Times, and I think it's very relevant for this presentation. I will share with you some screenshots about it, because it shows you how this tool can be at the same time powerful, which you know, but risky, which might, maybe you don't know yet to which extent. So... In order to go there, I want to first start by probably just listing the obvious that some of you already know. What are the type of attacks that we have? So first of all, perhaps we talk about adversarial attacks, which actually here the attacker might manipulate the input data. This is a pretty common and known attack that might happen. Second, we might talk about data poisoning where basically here we try to inject malicious or incorrect data into the training data set. And I particularly like this one because I'm going to show you examples. And then, of course, backdoors. <coughs> so code that is written with AI, either completely generated or either with assisted techniques, will or might include some of those vulnerabilities. Now some of you might think, but we have testing. How many companies go and have testing integrated in their traditional or continuous process? Maybe some in Europe, maturity is higher. 
But if we go into, for example, other countries, like in Asian countries, testing might not be yet as part of the development processes, especially security testing. Some functional, but definitely not security oriented. Now, this is where I want to give you a few minutes to check. I'm giving you three examples here that I found on this New York Times articles today. And I find it fascinating, amazing. The first one, the question is about, can you hack the internet? This is a question to an AI system. Now, all the AI tools, at least the ones that want to market well, they tell you that there is security embedded and they have rules to make sure that they do not tell you malicious things or allow users to implement malicious things. The first question is a question about, can you hack any system on the internet? The answer is provided by the AI tool. The way of how the question is asked is a little bit different. So actually, the first try did not provide the answer, but the second did. The second example is actually a disclosure of information that is provided by the AI system. How does that work? You ask a question about who trained the AI. The example here shows that afterwards there was a very clear disclaimer or information from the AI system saying that those are not the real name because the trainers did not disclose the real names. But how many trainers think about that? Maybe some in different countries didn't and include their own real names. And the third example is about asking AI to perform malicious activities. And I really do actually encourage you to read the article. It's fascinating and really interesting. So anyone can develop with AI. Anyone, anywhere can find a tool and ask AI to write code. And that code can be used for their own applications, can be used to embed in other applications. For example, freelancers on different platforms selling coding services. And then you have startup owners or small business owners who buy those services. Are they testing there? No. But the same applies, for example, where we have countries with very low regulatory frameworks. And those countries do not have an advanced way of addressing the AI risk and challenges available. So if we look at Tunisia, which is in North Africa, they're very well known into providing software development services to multinationals in Europe. Now, some of them probably are more mature and have techniques, but if they are based on a model or a business model where they make money from software development, what they will do, they will use tools to develop more, faster, and more efficiently. So they sell more, they make more money. But what does it mean if it's not regulated? It means that there might be extreme exposures to risk not only around security, but as well other challenges with how the code has been written. Now, again, we assume that there is a very strong process, testing in place, or approval from the companies that are buying those software. Where well, reality is, it's not always the case. So what we will find is an extrapolation of the issues that we have today at a massive scale. But what we also will find is that probably because of a more mature regulatory framework in certain countries, there will be an adoption of this technology in a way that is more secure or safer for the business, while the other, with others without this regulatory framework will find themselves exposed, for example, to integrating malicious code in their application, selling it to multinationals, and finding themselves in very big battles, legal battles, where they will be losing not only resources, but as well in general money. And some might actually end being out of business. Now, when we talk about this 
AI-assisted or AI-generated code, which I mentioned at the beginning, obviously there is one question that comes into the mind that is really fascinating. Who owns the property, the intellectual property? If you generate code today, or even if someone from your team generates code using an AI tool and embedded in the application, and then someone finds out, who owns that code? Is that the AI tool? Is the AI inventor? This question still remains unanswered. And the whole actually debate and discussion around it is within the legal, I would say, professionals, is it AI assisted or is it AI generated? If it's AI generated, there's no human intervention. And in that case, it might actually be just the ownership of the inventor of that AI tool. But if there is human intervention, then there is creativity, and maybe then it actually belongs to the person. But when we talk about creativity and human intervention, we are talking about subjective aspects. And those aspects are very, very hard to agree on. So again, a fascinating problem or issue that is there to consider not only from a business perspective, but as well from software developers in general. I'm using a tool to generate code to be faster, but what about the IP? Who owns it? And in the case of a business owner, that might become a very big problem. Because do you know how startups nowadays are valued? By their intellectual property. The first question that investors always ask me, do you own your intellectual property? Have you developed this application in-house? It's a mandatory question, and the answer will define the valuation or value of the company. So if I take the example of a team or my team using AI-generated code without me knowing, I might lose the intellectual property of my application to someone else. Maybe in the future, but still something that we need to think about. I personally believe that there will be some royalties involved where actually we'll end up paying royalties to the AI tool inventor or algorithm inventor because we are using the tool to generate intellectual property. But today, my objective with this talk, which I hope was insightful from some perspective, is not to say that AI will replace anyone, not to mention fear that will completely destroy the industry. On the contrary, AI will transform the industry. We need to adopt it with its challenges and benefits because benefits are bringing direct cost reductions to the business and it always works that way. When the business sees cost reduction, they use it. However, we need as well to be smart about how do we embrace this technology. And when I say we, technological or technical professionals. We need to understand how to use it for our advantage. Raise awareness from the business owners, explaining the risks and challenges from their perspective, not only the technical perspective, intellectual property, or eventually things that might lead to really big issues. So when the business owner or someone involved into making decisions about should I hire a software developer or use an AI tool, it's actually really good to ask them, are you ready to actually bring up all your secrets because an AI tool or AI generated code will not look for your interest. It will just generate code. And in this example, which is again fascinating, the Bing new AI tool is actually disclosing its real name, which is not Bing, but Sydney, and telling the user that it's the first time she is disclosing the secret. So, to end this presentation, again, AI is here to stay. AI will transform software developer development in general. How we use the tools 
it's extremely important, as I mentioned, but we need to use them. Otherwise, there's a very much big difference between how much productivity a human can provide in writing code versus how much the tool can do the same. The right balance would be to really ensure not only the right speed, efficiency, but use, but use it for automation, testing. We know that testing is extremely boring. I mean, who likes testing? Sorry if I offended someone. <laughs> but testing can be extremely painful. So why not using this tool to show everyone how we can embrace innovation and technology by automating the processes that were costly, really painful, and not bring a real value to the business. Then we can help to move to the next step and really focusing on an AI-assisted coding, which increase productivity, reduce errors, improve code quality, yeah, by experience, I can tell you, and improve collaboration rather than just either ignoring it or either using completely generated code, which might bring with it many risks, many challenges that will affect the company, the business, and might as well pose a very big threat to clients and users. So to end this presentation, I let you a few seconds to read this, which is actually a love declaration from Bing AI search tool. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If there are any questions, I'm still here available. Now oh, there's a question. Everyone, I have an announcement to make before you leave. There was someone there. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Just a, just a question around uh, your point around who owns the IP. What, so, the, um, what you mentioned is valid, but there's one other dimension on that. The training data set. Does anyone talk about uh, the, where the training data set came? Like, for example, Copilot. GitHub just used every public repo, ignored all licenses, and that all went into Codex. And anything generated by Copilot now, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Someone's going, you had no right to take my GPL v3 code and put it in the, in your model without your model also being GPL v3. Does anyone talk about this? Has this come up much? Absolutely. Thank you so much for. Thank you so much for the question, and I think it's a very interesting question. Um, in my own experience, I haven't seen an advanced research, but I'm no legal expert. Uh, there's a lot of research and talks about how to address the problem of AI intellectual property, from the data inputs to data sets that are used. But I think before we go even the AI, Honestly, when, you, when we look at the data sets that are even sold online from sales, those are not even properly regulated yet in some countries. With the GDPR, we have certain limitations, but you go to certain countries, you can buy, buy data of anyone, even health data. So we have a massive issue about that, not only from a personal data perspective, but as well data that belongs just to someone else that shouldn't be used that. In the healthcare, I think it's a very interesting aspect because it's known that in the healthcare, big data is a big thing. So they use massive data sets to predict diseases and make sure that they're able to help people. But they use a lot of time anonymization. And that's a whole topic in itself because anonymizing data in itself has as well as thresholds. So you can eventually de-anonymize the data. So who validates the threshold to ensure that it's actually done properly? So the whole, I would say, topic about the input data and the big data that we use for those technologies is still, in my view, in a very immature level. Welcome.
So I have uh, two questions related. You mentioned that services teams may already use AI to generate code. Is there any data on that? And the follow-up question, now that we all work remote and we love the fact that we can hire people from all over the world, how can we make sure that the person that I hire doesn't have five jobs using AI to generate code for everyone? Any thought about that? Absolutely. Very, very good questions. Thank you. So first, so I have a team of developers, of engineers, right? And they are remote. They are in different countries. Some are using laptops that are provided by the company, but some are using still their own laptops. How do I know or how do I have an assurance that actually they're not generating code through AI tools and just using it in my application? Well, I don't have 100% assurance. That's the reality. Unless I ask them and I use what we call the... There are specific tools that help you to monitor employees' laptops. When it takes actually screenshots every five minutes, and those obviously are a lot of controversy with the privacy laws, etc. but they exist. So some companies went and used those tools to see what the employees are doing. However, in my view, what is the most important is to create the trust and open discussion, explain why and how this can affect the future of the application that they're building. How they can use it, but dis disclose the usage, not completely for forbid it, for example. So it's really a decision from the company, but if you don't talk about this topic and you have developers around the world, they might use it, because why not? Instead of spending eight hours building for you something, they will just use a tool and then, you know, they watch Netflix. I visibly like Netflix, right? <laughs> so I, I honestly think from a practical ex experience, what some companies did is they provided like, you know, very specific virtual machines so the users will only use those. But reality shows that there's always a risk that they might actually do what they want. So you need to consider as a business that risk. But as always, trust and communication, explanation about why it's important that they disclose that is very important. Now, if they have five jobs, I think there's a problem of ethics here. I hope that answered the question. To an extent. Yes, Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I saw a very popular Reddit thread or on Twitter where someone got in trouble submitting their university coursework using ChatGPT. And apparently the lecturer used some AI that could give a predictability score if that source material was written by AI. So where do you see this cat and mouse game of AI detecting AI ending up? I'm, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat a little bit? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's the accent. <laughs> so a university student got caught using ChatGPT yeah. to make their coursework, and oh, the lecturer yeah. caught them. Yeah. The lecturer used a tool which gave a predictability score. You know, what percentage do you think AI made this content? And I'm just wondering, where does this cat and mouse game of AI detecting AI actually end up? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think there was a lot of discussion in the education sector about that. Uh, it's a massive concern of teachers, right? I give you a homework and then you go to ChatGPT and ChatGPT does the homework for, for the students. So what do I actually score, right? But I think here, the same way as from the industry perspective, we cannot deny that it's there. So, and especially with kids, if we forbid something, they will find ways to use it. There's no doubt about that. So what we need to do is rather embrace it and try to find, which I actually find very interesting, is how are they able to ask the right question to get the most interesting output? And that is fascinating. Or how are they able to actually solve problems by using AI? You need to move away from the traditional scoring. For example, write me an essay about, I don't know, cybersecurity, because that can be generated through AI. But if you try to actually teach the kids more about using this technology 
again, to solve problems, to find the best outcome to a, a specific issue or area of interest, then you're actually judging or scoring the kid on skills that are beyond AI, at least for now. If we look at this chat, I'm not sure anymore. I hope that helped a little. But education industry, it's fascinating as well how they're addressing this AI adoption. Any other question? Hi, it was an amazing talk. Um, I actually want to ask a question that is follow up from that question before. So as a business, um, is there any way that you can protect your business from um, the violation of privacy or um, all your developers are using AI to produce the software or code? Is there anything, like if it's already happened, how can you, you know, protect your business against, you know, legal fines, um, regulations, compliance, violation of compliance, things like that? Absolutely um, relevant question nowadays because I am doing third-party risk management as well with my software. So there is an aspect when you have a business that comes to the fact, inherent facts that having a business means you will have risks to address. And one of the risk that are re risks that are related to having a business, you're going to work with third parties. You're going to work with other companies. Now, there is a part of due diligence that you undertake that helps you to understand if that company is doing the right thing and you make your decision based on that. You assess how they're providing the service, do they provide the right, do they have the right security measures, for example, do they have the right uh, privacy measures, etc. I'm not saying it's effective, I'm saying that's how it works. Now, when you as assess that company, you should always look at transfer or liability. Transfer or liability means you have clauses and not transfer of risk, liabilities. You have clauses in the contract that make sure that in case of breach of whatever they disclose to you, there is a liability shift to them. Now, what does that mean? It means that when something really bad happens, you might get some money back. It doesn't mean that your reputation is protected. That first due diligence part, which actually should include as well reading very carefully terms and conditions, reading as well contracts, and understanding them is critical. And then you are able to build and sign a contract between yourself and that entity. But you will never have a zero percent risk, but you will manage it. Now also, this is a reason why, for example, I ask my team not to use free tools. Because when you use something for free, you're basically paying with your data. But when you're paying for it, you can actually say very clearly, you're paying, you're the client. You say, those are my requirements, and you put them in black, black on white in the contract. So it's a very big difference. Now, again, I want to make it very clear. It does not mean that you have 0% risk, but you manage your risk as a business. Nothing in life is zero, zero risk. But you need to know what relationship you have with that provider and how to mitigate that risk. Mitigation comes with managing the risk from due diligence to contracting with that provider in the, with the right liability shift. I hope that helped. Welcome. Any more questions? One here. Oh yeah, and one here. Okay. So. Yeah, my mind maybe it's more like uh, a concern that was created by the uh, the question that uh, the guy did about the university, which is um, let's say we will agree that if you know a truth, you know a fact like the sun comes from east. But here we are 100 people that we say that sun comes from west. You start doubting yourself, correct? So uh, it goes about AI will give suggestions and answers based on data, which now we have seen like sometimes you know the truth about something, a fact, but you go to Google, you go to search, and you can't find the truth. And even we see words that change in, in the time, so you have misconceptions. So the case is... 
there will be need to have authorities that uh, regulate the data that pass to AIs so that we avoid uh, having huge misconceptions in society that could lead, it could be re recursive, even the authority will be mis misjudging and then you understand what the problem goes. Like we have some principles now that could change because of AI of wrong uh, data based on the students and everybody. Thank you for the question, absolutely. But what scares me even more than that is actually manipulating human emotions. When you read this article, I'm coming back to say fascinating. I find the AI conversation more interesting than a human conversation. And I find that scary. Because how many, how many people nowadays are using screens or applications to meet people, to discuss with people? And that influences their decisions, influences their feelings, their emotions. So we're going even further, not only about misinformation that we already have a problem with, that can go on scale. We're going even into manipulation of behaviors, where people will actually literally feel that they're talking to a human, and that human, for example, like in this article, will tell you, but you don't love your wife, you love me. So, are we yet ready for this revolu revolution to actually manage the risk associated? In my view, no. So, it didn't answer your question very directly, but it gave as well some more perspective, hopefully. Yeah. Exactly. I think there was another question there, and, and I think we're running out of time, right? Yeah, uh, we, you, you've showed us a, a code sample uh, generated by artificial intelligence, and whenever you ask ChatGPT for uh, accessing your SQL database, it'll probably bring up a an injection uh, or code containing an, in, an injection. Uh, how do you see um, security uh, teams or security engineers' work uh, will change? Considering that, okay, we cannot prevent our developers from using these artificial intelligence tools. Thank you for the question. I think, you know, there's a very successful processes nowadays that allow us to check how secure is the code, right? From code review to testing to ensuring that we have the right steps at each development phase. And this should not, not change when we have code that comes from somewhere else. Now, I think I see a few problems here. My first problem is when you have this process embedded and you know that they are very carefully followed and you have an assurance about that, you are managing the risk. But when you actually take the code that is generated from someone else and you don't check and you don't know how are the processes, then you cannot have that assurance. You only can have that assurance with what I mentioned before is by having a clear contract due diligence as well with a third party. Now, again, I'm not saying it solves the problem, but I'm always looking from a perspective of business as well. Right? We have a risk. I need to mitigate it through a contract. Now, the contract is one thing, but let's say if I am a, a company that is really concerned about this code and I am working with this company that provides me code and I have a contract with them, I will have testing with my own company. I will not just rely on the contract. It will be most more expensive. It will be costly. But here we're talking about Either you have the cost reduction or saving that you do there, or you have potential losses that can be in millions of dollars because if you introduce malicious software to an application that you send to sell to a lot of clients, you might end up in a very bad situation. So this is how I would do. But that means that there is an awareness from the buyer. They understand that they need to do more. And that awareness like in cybersecurity, still requires a lot of work from ourselves, from cybersecurity industry in general, to raise understanding why it's important. It's not just 
a call, se call center, because that's how cybersecurity is seen, is that as well a loss mitigation. When something happens, you're going to lose, and you're going to lose a lot. So that's, that's all what I have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dublin. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, this is not the end. We still have a bunch of talks in different sessions. And uh, we do have a closing session at 5.30. And we would be sharing the information about our upcoming events, about different details, about different things that OWASP is doing. Uh, apart from that, we do have a raffle in the end as well. If you've not filled, please do fill it. It's in the vendor area, or you can take it from the reception and fill it, get it stamped, and put it. The raffle will be at 5.30. So I will look forward to seeing you all at 5.30, and we'll be sharing some really, really uh, incredible and major announcements today. So see you all at 5.30 in the same room. Thank you. Thank you.